here as he's still Okay, I've been instructed to chop chop and demonstrate just the utility <laughs> of the uh, bone scalpel, bone blade. I call it endosonic because it rolls off the tongue much easier. And it's essentially um, very similar to the open systems that's out there. I think the closest and there's uh, one other company, but the simplest principle is that it's a metal rod that basically vibrates back and forth so really fast and through that vibration, when it touches something rigid, it will break it down, kind of like a cast saw, but super duper high frequency. And I'm sure that there's an element of heat that's involved. And I really like using this for doing that superior articular facet resection during a foraminal decompression. So there are times where I'm working literally right next to the exiting nerve root, for example, an L5S1 bony foraminal stenosis with disc space collapse and maybe a little bit of asymmetric disc collapse. And the tip of the superarticular process, that thing that looks like a hook, will dive into the um, exiting nerve root. So you want to basically resect that whole thing. So there's two ways to do it. You can either go transarticular, you go into the facet joint, and an L5S1, that facet joint is very coronal, so you can get in there from a lateral approach, and then you start inside the joint and work your way out. But usually what I do is I start on the outside working in, and I try to dock the exposure um, near Wagner's arch, near the pedicle, and then I work my way up and I expose that whole bony corridor, and then I just start resecting it, and then when it's really useful is when I get right next to the nerve roots. So when I use the uh, spinning burr, two things happen. Number one, there's a lot of snow from the bone debris, which momentarily makes it very difficult to visualize the nerve root. And then it's a spinning device. So if I slip or I'm not aware of exactly where I am, um, I could scratch the exiting nerve root, which is bad. So having a ultrasonic uh, bone tool um, avoids having this spinning instrument and has a much lower rate of snow. So I'm not going to be able to do the facetectomy because I've been instructed not to. But what I'd like to do is just show you its performance profile on the bone. So let me find the bone real quick. Can I have the? So Cho, when you're using that uh, bone scalpel, um, do you, do you oh, sorry, ultrasonic scalpel. Um, so when you use that, do you, do you um, typically not take a big piece of bone because it's hard to take it out? Do you kind of take, take like small pieces of bone? Because it's hard to remove a big piece of bone to the, the endoscope. Yeah, I have a hard time making, you know, like when we use the osteotome. Yeah. I'm just orienting myself. I have no idea where I am right now. <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> um, okay, where was the bone? I should have paid attention more. This is like you don't get that tactile feedback of a release like you normally do. So what you have to do is, is that my step right there, yellow? All right, so watch what's going to happen. It starts out really slow, and then it'll start melting inside there. You don't want to torque on it too much. And I just create a footprint because when I use the, the burr, I can tell when there's a release. I can't tell the release very well, but you see how nothing's moving there? So if the nerve was right next to me, I could work as long as I could see everything very precisely without worrying about winding anything up or scratching anything. I'd have to get right on there to hurt it. So when I use this, I create like a little, like an outline of a footprint, and then I go deeper and deeper and deeper. Joel, do you think you can, when you're done with that, kind of show us outside the cadaver how mm -hmm. the tip of that thing looks like so we can kind of understand yep. how this thing I works? I think it's probably easier just to show it. It's a circle. Okay. It's a little tube that's uh -huh. hollow in the middle. Okay. So it almost works like a bird. How hard is it to switch over to the blade? There's also, a, it looks like the end of a butter knife. Mm. So if you want to make like a really sharp cut, which a lot of people do, but per, you know, I personally like to make like little circular ex, uh, resections. But if I wanted to just make like a little L-shaped line, check this thing out. So see, it's more like a blade. Okay. So now I can just like create like a create like a little line. It's like using long chopsticks. 
<laughs> and, and I can just keep going all along whatever line that I wanted to create. Do you just put it typically on the max? And I don't go, say that again? I said, do you just put it on the max speed or did you ever change the settings at all or is it always max speed? Oh man, I always go on max, but <laughs> I'm sure there's settings, but there's only one setting that I've ever used. <laughs> Usually there's much less snow. I think we're having some flow problems again. I bet you I pushed on something because I lost the flow. But you can imagine like if I wanted to make an L-shift cut like in the inferior edge of the cephalad lamina on an interlaminar approach, or I wanted to truncate the cephalad tip. Yeah, I have no flow now. The cephalad tip of the superarticular process, you can imagine I can just create a line and I'll just go deeper and I'll crosshatch this and start breaking it off. What I don't do, like I do with the burr, is go all the way down to the ligament and flavum because I have a hard time feeling that release on the other side. So I want to get to the inner table, for example, and then do it under direct vision. You can see it's a situation, thank you, where the visualization is much easier. So it's a very different feel. It's like um, the difference between skiing and snowboarding. It looks the same but it's two totally different sports. So when you get to the cadaver lab, we should do a transramal approach like an, to L5S1 and do a facet resection. And I think in terms of demo, I don't really need to do much more. I think it's gonna be much more interesting for you guys to play with this themselves because it's this kind of feel and performance profile that's really different between this and the burr. And there are times where I have both the burr and the ultrasonic blade because I'm fancy and I don't care how much money I spend at the hospital. But if you did, you'd probably just want to pick one or the other. So, so Chil, thank you for oh. that. That's a great demonstration of the, of the ultrasonic scalpel.